Hello, my fellow gnomes. My name is Nemcode, and I'm back with more tips on improving your studio creations. I made a video on this a while ago, and I promised I'd return with more. So here I am, thanks to my wonderful sponsor, Brilliant.org. We'll talk more about them later, but first off, let's get back to the fundamentals of a fantastic build. Now, normally I start out by showing you guys something in studio, but today I actually want to take things a step further back and talk about planning. Even with the wildest creativity in the world, you're nearly always going to need some inspiration to start off with. So whenever I'm doing a new build, I always go and gather some reference images for the sort of thing I want to make. This is especially important when you're trying to replicate something from the real world, as you'll find it much easier to make models of the right proportion if you actually have something to base it off. To demonstrate the power of a good reference image, I had two attempts at making a quick model of a telephone. One without a reference image, which you can see here. And there's a few obvious pitfalls. It's not a beautiful model. And there's a few silly things I missed, like the the order of the, the numbers on the keypad aren't quite right. And the handle looks pretty ugly and the overall shape and scale just looks off. Uh, contrast it with this one, where I then took the reference image and tried to make a model based on it. It's not a perfect model, it's not an exact replica by any means, but you can tell the size and scale is a lot closer and it looks a lot more like an actual telephone which is always a good idea. Now, probably I could improve this if I went into something like Blender and I got more of a smooth shape. It's always a bit difficult with the angular structure to get something exactly uh, just using wedges and corner wedges, which I've done here. And I think it provides a great example of the power of using an image to help you. Now, don't feel ashamed of trying to recreate any references you're using. Uh, in fact, this can really be a great way to practice. Despite what some people might try to tell you, it's really not the same as copying somebody's work, as whatever you make will always have your own unique style, even if it is inspired by something or somebody else. After all, you're the one that made it. And at the end of the day, that's basically how making stuff works. Everything is inspired by everything else if you trace it far enough back. And this really applies for something small like making a telephone all the way up to making a giant villain's lair. And if you are trying to make maps, then this planning stage becomes even more important as a well-designed map can really make or break your game. So let's talk about map design. Now, there's not exactly a standard rule, but if there's one thing I've learned about making video game maps, it's that how you utilize the space is always far more important than how it actually looks. Having a good sense of flow will really improve your gameplay far more than pretty lighting ever will. Now, how you lay it out will depend on the exact type of gameplay that your game involves. But for example, let's think about a PvP game. So I've set up this thing in the studio. We've got a red team over here and we've got a blue team, team over here. And it's a shooter, it's an open field and they can instantly see each other. They can shoot at each other. And if the red team if they manage to charge forward, right, there's not really any point. Both both the red and the blue are going to charge at each other, but they can just shoot at each other from the middle, right? There's not really much happening. There's no flow around the area. No one's ever going to get onto this side. What would be the point? It's all rather empty and lifeless. So how could we uh, add in a bit more life to it? Well, the starters, we don't want them to be able to shoot each other from the spawn, so maybe you add in some walls. Okay, that's a big improvement. Uh, it provides cover people, people can run around the sides, but there's still not really any flow. It's not got really much going for it. So how about we replaced our walls with uh, a set of lanes? Now this is a common thing you'll see in map design, especially for PvP is trying to channel the players, give them different routes. So they could do down the side like this, all the way down. So this is one lane and there's another lane on the opposite side. And then we've got this big lane through the middle, which everyone can all shoot. And we've also got a couple of crossroads through. So everything is connected 
And if you're not careful, you can get shot from one of the other lanes. So we can see this is a lot more interesting. We've got flow around the map, different ways of moving around, uh, which always helps a lot. Now, one thing uh, we'd probably do to take this one step further is we could throw in some walkways. And once we do that, we have some little steps up here so you can go up and then you've got shooting from multiple levels. So suddenly we've got loads of variation and there's loads of freedom for the players to move around. So that's how you can, how you want to be thinking if you're making a PVP map, but the same kind of rules apply to all multiplayer maps. It's all about movement around it. So for another example, let's look at maps I made for my game, Teddy. Now I've talked about these before in each of my Teddy build videos, but I think these provide an interesting case study as they're somewhat unique gameplay wise as different areas of the map unlock as the game progresses. Um, but I also need to ensure that there's both room to escape the monster and that there aren't too many dead ends. You always want to avoid dead ends in map design where you can. Now, this is where the planning really comes in. And I find it really helps to draw out a basic version of what you're aiming for first. So I often do this on paper, a quick sketch, so I can know what I want to do before I'm even into studio. I find that helps to clarify my thoughts a little bit. Now, in terms of the maps I made, I think the daycare level I made achieved a really good balance in regards to gameplay uh, by adding multiple exits to different rooms. So if we view it from the top here, we can see the player usually always has some sort of escape room from each room. There are a couple of dead ends here and there, but that's okay. We, we, uh, we want some ways for the monster to be able to corner the player as well. Now, in contrast, if you look at this forest map I designed, uh, I put a lot of efforts into the aesthetics here, attempting to make a really cool uh, natural forest environment. Now, while I was pleased with the appearance, I think it was a massive failure gameplay wise. And again, if we view it from the top, we can see that there's not really any alternate routes. The flow of the map, uh, it's all just one giant circle. There's no really multiple escape routes. And if you have the monster on your tail, you have to do an entire circuit of the map. It's not got very much going for it. So this is something you really got to bear in mind when making your maps. Um, another thing that I've uh, been experimenting with is adding in lots of different angles. So with chapter four, I tried to break myself away from a strict square grid so I could utilize the space a bit differently. I think doing little tweaks like rotating a building after you built it just so it's at a very slight angle on the plot can make a huge difference to the overall appearance of a level. And if you are worried about moving stuff around on weird angles, it's worth remembering you can make good use of global and local axis movement by tapping Control X on your keyboard. Uh, and this just allows you to move it along its plane rather than awkwardly feeling like you're fighting against the, the global axis. There's loads of little interesting things you can do. I won't go into all of them here. Uh, but if you have something you like to do with your maps, then let me know in the comments. I'll be interested to find out. Now, before we get too carried away, let's talk about file structure. Oh, yeah. Wow. With any project, once the building gets underway, your workspace rapidly starts to fill up with tons and tons of parts. And while having loads of parts is inevitable, it's really important to keep things organized. I'd say there's probably nothing that deflates my enthusiasm more than hopping to, into someone else's project, give them a hand, and then seeing a really messy, disorganized workspace increases the development time so much. It takes forever to find things and it's just so easy to get lost in the process while building. Um, but you should really take the time when you finish building for the day, tidy things up a bit and use some folders and groups. It's also important to make good use of naming conventions so that uh, everything follows a nice directory structure. These are uh, no set rules here, but if you look at any of my projects, such as Teddy here, you'll see that I try to order the map into different folders for the doors 
and the different areas and so on. Okay, we've talked about planning now, we've talked about our flowcharts, and we've talked about file structures. All exciting stuff. But now we're going to up the ante by injecting some style. Talking of which, allow me to introduce you to this video's sponsor, Brilliant.org. If you like learning about stuff in a fun way, much like this video, then you'll probably like Brilliant. It's an educational website packed with thousands of amazing interactive resources that you'll learn about things like programming and artificial intelligence fast. The cool thing about this website is all the learning is really interactive, so it's not just sitting through boring lessons. You actually feel like you're putting everything into practice. With all the talk about AI recently, I've been following their Neural Networks course and found it really easy to cover the topic just a small section at a time. If you want to check them out and everything else Brilliant has to offer completely free for 30 days, then you can use my special link, brilliant.org slash gnomecode. First 200 of those will also get 20% off the premium annual subscription. So don't miss out. Okay, so back to the style department. You've built yourself some kind of huge map, but what do you do with all these drab, empty surfaces? So we need to talk about walls. Now, walls are pretty boring. Uh, there really isn't much worse than a completely flat surface that just stretches on and on and on and on and on. Now, we don't need to just get rid of walls. We obviously want to use walls, but there's things we can do to break them up. So you can see here with this map, I've avoided having one continuous wall by adding in these large blocks. You know, if I just had one straight wall all the way down, you can see how much more boring it suddenly starts to look. So variation is really important. Uh, now, if you're making something like a brick wall, it can be really tempting to just throw on a brick texture and think, oh, you're done. There we go. That is a brick wall. Uh, but actually, if we look at some real life examples, this can be a huge mistake. It's common to see all kinds of subtle details in real life, such as contrasting brickworks, stone slab support columns and more even the absolute ugliest of brick buildings usually have at least some discernible features just by adding the slightest of additions onto a brick wall can really transform it so if i was to change this top line make it uh, say a concrete and change its color ever so slightly it already starts to look more interesting Admittedly, it probably doesn't really go with this minimalist uh, map. But you can see how just adding two tiny uh, parts at the bottom there, if I just change the size as well, so now we've got a bit coming in and out, uh, we've just tripled the level of detail that our wall had. We could go a bit further and add in some support columns onto it like so and then if we were to dot them along the wall say at five stood intervals like so we have a pretty cool looking wall now if you're making an interior wall then you can add loads of things onto the detail there so we could do little things we could like add in a skirting board that's something i like to do you'll see i have that in all of my rooms in teddy for instance so again, I've created a little bit of basic paneling, barely using any parts, but suddenly the wall looks way more interesting. Now you can see I am mixing up the colors here a bit. So let's talk about colors. Okay, so I don't know if some of you folks are colorblind or just have terrible fashion sense, but I have seen some truly horrendous designs on Roblox. How can we improve things? Now we can try and be all scientific and look at a color wheel, but really, it's just about having some actual sense when it comes to using colors in your game. You want to use shades that can actually complement and provide contrast rather than having to fight against one another. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say I have these two parts right here. Now, they're both the same color. We've got this floor on the wall. And it looks a bit odd having them both the same. So generally what you want to do, if you just take the color and you just ever so slightly go and get the color and tweak it ever so slightly. So if you make it a little bit darker you get a little bit of contrast then with that other color. That's a very slight contrast. You might want a little bit more, or you could make it slightly lighter if you turned it right up, made it a little bit white. 
And there you go, suddenly you've got some contrast. Now, if you try to make this like a bright red, it doesn't work. It's too much. It's too bright. And of course, using just two colors, if you get a little bit of gentle variation, you can create a color palette. And it, you can make a lot using just two or three colors. Take, for example, this shed model I made. It's only really got the three colors, the two main wood colors and then black for the, the handle, the hinge, the roof and so on. Uh, and then if you try to do this and added in some more colors, if I change the door and I had different ones for the hinge and the handle and the supports, it all starts to look a bit messy quite quickly. Now you can do a lot with colors by playing around with how you actually use them. It can really change the theme of your game. Now a popular sort of color theme in Roblox is using cartoony colors, lots of bright colors. We see this in a game like Jailbreak and it works really well with the sort of simplistic, almost plastic shapes that we get in so many Roblox games that we're normally working with. Uh, so for example, now if you are wanting to make a cartoony color theme, it's important not to go too bright. So let's say I've got this little model here of a house and I've set all the parts to the brightest reds and greens they can be. It's all neon and it's all a bit garish. It's too much and too chaotic. So if you bring it down a tone ever so slightly, you get something like this, right? It's nice and friendly and it looks a little bit more relaxed. It's not in your face. Now, when you start to desaturate the colors, as in make them less bright, uh, it does get a little bit interesting because if we go a step further, you'll get something like this, right? So you could say it's a little bit washed out, but this works quite well for a more naturalistic, uh, if you're looking for a realism based look. We could see this uh, maybe in a game like the Wild West, for example. Uh, and of course you could play with this and you could get uh, a sort of a post-apocalyptic or maybe some sort of modern futuristic sort of minimalist type look. Now all these stuff that you can do with colors really gets compounded when you start introducing lighting. So this is just with the default lighting inside the, the old base plate template. But if I was to start to add a whole new palette and feel to your game, Again, if we look at something like the Wild West, they do this really well to give different areas of the map a completely different feel. Some are quite bright and warm with a sort of red color. And at other times, it's all green and dark and swampy and sort of mysterious. So there's a lot of room to play about with there. And it's definitely worth bearing in mind when you're making your next map. All right, I've blathered on for some 20 minutes now. Hopefully this gives you some ideas on improving your next build and taking your game perhaps to the next level as well. But if on the other hand, you've forgotten exactly what I was talking about the last 20 minutes, let's summarize. Step one, have a plan. Step two, don't use silly colors. Step three, start your free trial with Brilliant.org. And thank you for watching. <laughs> I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.